Thank you for coming tonight. It's a nice group here tonight. It looks like about 80% of you are over here. <laughs> I don't know if that's a political statement or not, but in your, to my left. Anyway. <laughs> um, my name is George Riley. Um, we're with Public Order now. You know what we're all about. We do. We have qualified for the ballot in November. So we're looking for. It's been an army of volunteers who have made this work so far, and we still have a home stretch to go. So we still look for help. We still look for volunteers. We still look for work that needs to be done. Uh, nobody wants to count their chickens before they're hatched, and I keep reminding people of this, as well as reminding me, because what we've done so far is pretty remarkable, and we are putting professional material out. We are putting um, uh, facts out. Uh, we're not getting facts from the other side, and I hope you should pay attention to that issue. Because what we have done is research all our material, we stand behind everything, we cite our sources, and we put facts together in a way that we think makes the uh, picture accurate. And what we're trying to do is get a follow-up on the best accuracy we can get, which is a bona fide feasibility study of Biden Calais. So, uh, that's what the election is all about, is getting the facts. We think our campaign is about giving you the facts, giving the public the facts. And we can still... Um, make this a successful campaign if we stick to our business. And our business is being serious about winning in November. Uh, so um, what I'd like to do is just have a, a quick little quiz or a show of hands. Uh, we've been trying to get the word out in different ways. Many of you are already on an email list of sorts. So I'm not asking you to raise your hand. But if anybody's here who heard about this event through Facebook, can we just get a show of hands at all if we have one? Um, all right, very few. I'll draw a few up from them. Okay. Um, and how about next door? It's also a good. Great. That's a, that's a good turnout. We did about 12 or so people or so. Thank you. And my last question was the weekly. There was a special public notice in the weekly. So, good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, let's get on with the program. Um, it's a little different program than we've had before. We've been trying to put together uh, speakers and presentations about um, just water issues in general and what agencies do and so on. But now we're getting closer and closer. There's some very specific things we want to address. And one is um, what's, what's going on in Marina and what is the Marina reaction or what are their priorities or what are their views of what uh, is, is taking place in their backyard. I'm going to... Our sequence will be Kathy Biala will speak first. She's head of the um, citizens group in Marina called Just Water. Mm -hmm. Justice, Water, Justice, but Just Water. Uh, then we'll have uh, Tom Moore, who's president of the Marina Coast Water District. And then we'll have the mayor of Mar Marina, uh, Bruce Delgado. So that'll be the sequence that we'll go through. What I ask is that you don't interrupt the speakers with questions, but at the end of each speaker's turn, they will ask for a few questions. We're not going to go into a big Q&A after each presentation, but if there are a few clarifying questions or whatever, uh, we will have that, and then we'll go to the next speaker, and then we'll have a more bona fide Q&A process at the end of the three speakers. So let me just lead off with one comment. Uh, there's a saying that's circulating somewhat, and when I saw this the other day, I thought, wow, what an opening for this event. The statement is this. If you're not at the table, you are on the menu. <laughs> and I think that may be a byline for what's happening here tonight. <laughs> so if no further ado, uh, I will, will be asking you to consider uh, signing up and helping us volunteers. We will be raising money. So there's a little, some envelopes outside for donations. We will not pass the hat tonight. Uh, and then we have a volunteer sheet that we would like people to consider uh, helping as we go along. So. Um, no further ado, I'm going to introduce, or let you, let Kathy have the phone, phone, excuse me. <laughs> hey, can everyone hear me? There seems to be an adjustment that we have to make. Is this okay? That's good. Right there. Okay, right here yeah. is good. So, um, my name is Kathy Biella, and I'm from...
from Citizens for Just Water. And tonight my topic is Making Sense of It All, and it's about the current process for the approval for the Calam Slantwell desalination project. And it's a very complex and convoluted uh, uh, process, so I have, I'm a very visual person, so I put it out in a map. Um, there it, are some tiny text on, on uh, some of the slides, so I will read out the text as we go along. First, I wanted to just give a little description of Citizens for Just Water. Our, our uh, website is c4justwater.org. Citizens for Just Water, we call ourselves Just Water, is comprised of groups and individuals sharing a common interest in preserving and protecting long-term sustainable water supplies with equity among competing interests. I'd like to start from the very beginning with this map. Um, if you look at the hatched, the uh, striped red, the, this area represents the Calam service area. The overlaid uh, dots in orange, and it includes all of this area as well, is the Monterey Peninsula Water Management District. And this is the public agency um, boundaries here. And you can see it's a fairly large area. And then right here in the green, is outlined the Marina Coast Water District, and it's much smaller, and it's to the north of it. Now, I'd like you to imagine a big pan stretching over here into this green area, and that is essentially what's happening. The Calam, and I want to say it as it is, they're stealing the water by reaching over into another water district and taking the water for free. There's no fee attached to taking the water without permission, without invitation, and without legal rights and taking the water to supply its own customers. So this is fundamentally um, one of the, um, the core issues um, among many, many others that I'm going to try to articulate tonight. So let's start at the beginning and um, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the history. And I have three boxes here with dark clouds over them. This first one says, illegal pumping of Carmel River cease and desist orders since 1995. That's 23 years of Calam pumping illegally from the Carmel River. And right now, the State Water uh, Board is very adamant that this stop now. And then the next box says, overdraft of the seaside basin resulting in basin adjudication with restrictions. So in 2000, Six, I think that's a six. Um, we, what we had is an overdraft of the seaside basin for which Calam has legal pumping rights, but it was overdrafted and that um, basically propelled a, an adjudication process, a legal process to define who gets the water and how much. And this third box with the dark cloud says, no new water sources developed by Calam since 1966. 1966 is when Calam um, uh, took over the, um, uh, the purveying of the water for the peninsula and parts of Seaside. Now they have said, they have claimed that they produce lots of new water, but I will say that it has been initiated by the, manage the water management district and then they initiated it and developed it and then Calam took, takes credit for joining in later. And what do these three dark clouds result in? No water for the peninsula and parts of the seaside. And Calam proposes a desalination pro project. Now, when we think of desalination, we think of ocean water only. And if we go down this way, this is the usual way for desalination. It's a screened ocean intake, and it's proven technology used globally. In fact, this kind of desalination from the ocean is the gold standard across the world at this point. And you see the little sunshine there? There's no water rights required. Um, the ocean, although it is a finite amount, it's kind of perceived as infinite at this point, and with global warming, probably we're gonna get even more water in the ocean. Now, there's another kind of uh, ocean water desalination plant, and I put it here only because this is what we anticipated and also Cal-Am promoted. They promoted their current project as subsurface ocean intake slant well. 
It is experimental. There is no such uh, successful slant well in this country or in the world for desalination of water. And uh, like uh, all the open ocean intakes, it requires no water rights. Looking back over here, this is the real project that we are faced with right now. The Calam slant well draws ocean water and groundwater. All of us have been pumping groundwater, so that's why we were looking, when we look towards desalination, we're looking towards a new source of water. In this case, this a particular version of the, the slant well draws from both. And I do want to caution everybody, don't be fooled by Calam's claim that this desal plant will be only taking a tiny amount of groundwater. They say in much of their literature that it's 92% ocean water. But that other part, that other percentage, is equal to probably two-thirds or more of the entire take of Marina Coast Water District from the groundwater in our basin. So again, the omission of data brings about distortions and, uh, and uh, leads people in ways that are not uh, kosher. So when you have groundwater, with any take of groundwater, whether it's in, even in your own jurisdiction, it requires water rights. And in this case, as we saw in the first slide, it's not even within the, their own ju water jurisdiction. They are taking water from another jurisdiction, and both of those cases do require groundwater rights. That's a big issue. We're always fighting about water. We're not fighting about ocean water. We are always fighting about groundwater rights. So let's continue to the next slide. <clears throat> Don't be intimidated. <laughs> I'll try to uh, break this up here. So here we've, we're following that same line. We're looking at the desalination uh, uh, approvals and CPUC approval process. Now, uh, I, I please stop me if, I, if I'm using acronyms or you don't understand this, but this is the California Public Utilities Commission. That is uh, the uh, state oversight agency for privately owned public utilities um, companies. Okay, so. Um, and just as an aside, if, if uh, the feasibility study goes through and there is a buyout, uh, CPUC will no longer be part of any equation in terms of your water in the peninsula and seaside. So following this line, um, there are basically four issues that have to be resolved in order for this uh, project to uh, reach fruition. And I'm just going to read them so we can get a flavor of the map. The first one to the right is water rights and no harm determination. The second one is an environmental impact report. The third one in orange is the economic feasibility evaluation. And the fourth one is the California Public Utilities Commission, I'll call it PUC, evidentiary hearings. So all of these we're going to talk about, but I just want you to see the overall map. So let's start at water rights and the no harm determination. Um, in my opinion, <laughs> water rights should have been determined before anything else. And yet, as you'll, you'll see, that that issue hasn't even been resolved today. So I'm thinking that that should have been one of the first things that we resolved, and it's not even resolved. So if we go down this line, we see that the PUC, which has the authority to approve this entire project, okay, um, they are saying they will not determine water rights. Then we go down to the State Water Board. We're getting the information that they also will not determine water rights. Um, and CalM has said that the State Water Board has said that they can get water rights. They have no water rights right now, none. They never have, they do not have any water rights in the Salinas Valley groundwater basin from which they expect to take water from, okay? But what they have said is that they could get water rights after the desal plant is built and operated and pumping, and it's called appropriative rights. So they are saying that they, that they can show that there is no harm to the basin 
and that nobody else is using that water, therefore it's useless. And on those grounds, they are anticipating getting water rights. And that really truly is, is like saying that I'm going to go to my next door neighbor and steal their car and later prove that I have rights to that car because you don't happen to be using it right this minute and because I think you know, you're, you're wealthy enough to, to buy another car, whatever the reasons are. But they're saying I can steal it and then later get water rights. Then there's another legal problem in this process, and that is um, in 2014, we had a new state law, and the abbreviations here are SIGMA, Sustainable Groundwater Management Act of 2014. And it essentially says that the users of uh, the groundwater have to restore the basin to 2015 levels of quality which is a big order. One, it involves many different entities trying to do this, which is a difficult thing since you know, we've been so conflictual. But now we have to work together to do this very difficult task in the face of advancing seawater intrusion. And we know that we just came out, the county came out with their latest um, seawater intrusion maps, and it's, it's not very pretty. Seawater intrusion is continuing to advance to the point that the County of Monterey, just this month, issued a moratorium on all new wells. Remember that the Salinas Valley groundwater basin from which Calam wishes to take water from it, the 180-foot aquifer, that that is already identified by the State Water uh, Board as one of California's 21 critically overdrafted basins. So you can understand the, uh, the difficulties in compliance with this new law when CalM is pumping 24.1 million gallons a day. Okay, so let's go to the next. Um, so there's a lot of no's circled with a slash down this whole thing. Let's go to the next one on environmental impact report. The closing of the public uh, public comment period for the final environmental impact re report. And this was the third time, by the way, that this was uh, gone through. The first, uh, the third iteration. Um, it, the public comment period closed in April of this year. And for those of you who wrote comments, there were volumes of it with very uh, excellent comments. We thank you very much for that. Um, in all of the two and 3,000 pages on any of these versions, the AEM science, it's called Airborne Electromagnetic Science. So it, they're imaging, 3D imaging of a large expanse of the basin going down to 1,000 feet. The, this is state-of-the-art um, science, and none of it was used. When it's already done, it was completely glass made. It was already paid for by MCWD, the Marina Coast Water District. Um, CalAM and uh, PUC knew about some of even the precursors to AEM, which was the ERT. This is done by Stanford University, and this study was completely not looked at. Um, PUC said that, um, that they had the prerogative to choose between two competing science, science technologies. Um, and they said that uh, um, uh, the AEM prov provided no new information, which Tom Moore from MCWD will completely, completely dispel that falsehood. Um, but this technology has not been used. Now when you think about the stakes of um, a region's sole source of water, that is their, the groundwater in Salinas Valley, it is hanging on proper science. This is like comparing a horse and buggy to 2018 Telsa. There, there is no con comparison. The, the science that CalAM used were vertical, eight random vertical wells. The AM science is 3D imaging, like an MRI. There is no comparison. And yet, it has not been used in any of the um, results for the environmental impact report. We are still wait, awaiting the final disposition on the environmental in, impact report. Let's go to economic feasibility. And all we see here is a big question mark with a lightning bolt. There's a problem here. Now, 
all of the rate payers. How many are rate payers of CalAM? Okay. <laughs> well, all of you have actually paid for the experimental desal plant, the art research and development. Um, that, that has uh, been in operation, the test slant well for three years now. So that was on your bill already. But, and by the way, you will never own that technology and you, you will never receive any benefits for the patent. So CalAM's shareholders will obviously <coughs> benefit and the holder of the slant well um, patent will certainly, his name is Dennis Williams, he will certainly gain possibly between the two of them millions. So that's part of this economic feasibility evaluation, but you still have six or nine more slant wells to pay for. That's only one. That was only a test well. So you still possibly have six to nine more. And do you know how much that costs? I mean, has anyone confirmed to you what, your, what, what that will cost the ratepayers? And additionally, when you build it, that is not saying that, you, that uh, you're not going to pay for the water as it comes on your bills. So you need to find out on a monthly basis how much that, that expensive desalination water will eventually cost you. And we have a question mark here because this issue of economic feasibility, um, we're not quite sure when and who will be evaluating that. So that's why there's, there's no process there. We just don't know. And I would say, just like with water rights, I think that the cost of it should have been one of the, the very first thing that we evaluated along with water rights. Because if it's too expensive and nobody can afford it, why are we not looking for alternatives? Okay, let's go to the last one. Uh, the PUC, the Public Utilities Commission evidentiary hearings. And it's a legal process and it results in settlement agreements. Only official parties to the proceeding can um, participate in these evidentiary hearings. And I think there's about 23. And I, and I have to say that um, Just Water, as well as Public Water Now, are um, part of the um, uh, official uh, parties. And um, there, there are few that are, are like us in terms of being citizen groups. Now, there are three phases that I want to talk about. Uh, phase one of the settlement agreements had to do with agreements about brine and return water um, allocations. And these are still being in the process of, of we're waiting for decisions. Uh, phase two is up here, and be, it's up here because it's not part of any of this process. It's already settled. Phase two uh, is, uh, is the promise of 3,500 acre feet of recycled water um, from Monterey One Water, which is a public agency also. And they are going to be providing the peninsula with that much um, recycled water. Yes. Oh, okay. And um, uh, phase three is um, just now being proposed and being vetted, and it looks like an, a, a great possibility. Phase three is the expansion of, of Pure Water Monterey, the recycling project under Monterey One Water. And in addition, MCWD is helping out by providing their some loaning some of their allocations of recycled water as well. We are still waiting for phase three and phase one. And uh, once uh, these are settled, we then need to see if this CPCN, it's a certifi certificate of public convenience and necessity, it's a strange term, but it, it's essentially the building permit for the, the Calab slant wells. And it is issued by um, the Public Utilities Commission. And if it is um, issued or not, there are two possible outcomes. One has a son, it's the approval of the phase three, which means no lawsuits, because we're not talking about groundwater uh, extraction, we're talking about recycled water, and it becomes a very affordable water scenario for the peninsula. Now, what if uh, no phase three occurs? Then there will be lawsuits. And there has to be, because there's been no determinations all along all these lines, right? And a marina's sole source of water is in jeopardy. So that is going to happen. And it's going to maybe 
go on for a protracted amount of time and cost a lot of money for a lot of people. So I want to reiterate the critical importance of this phase three. It can provide drinking water for the next 10 years or more, up to 30 years even. It satisfies the cease and desist order timelines for reductions of Calam's take from the Carmel River. It does not involve a for-profit corporation. Remember that um, public agencies um, are not into making profits, but of course corporations are, so it adds a whole different dimension. It, the phase three is a collaborative effort among Monterey One Water, Monterey Peninsula Water Management District, and the Marina Coast Water District, all public agencies. It's much more affordable than, than the desalinated water does not jeopardize a neighboring water district and will result it will not result in any lawsuits because again it's not about groundwater it's about recycled water and gives the region time to carefully plan a regional a true regional desal project which we probably need as a region is some sort of new um, uh, water from the ocean but Calam is opposing this option with all its might so what can you do to help um, Please check out our website for further information, uh, letters that you can write, and also the California Com uh, Commission has been instrumental in promoting the Calam desal project without a, a whole lot of scrutiny and challenges. And those three decisions really, um, um, really were critical. And we want them to know um, all of these things down here that there are no groundwater rights. It violates the Marine Coastal plan. We have to use the best science, and ratepayers can't afford this. And a viable and vetted, affordable regional alternative is available right now as we speak. And the last thing is please vote for a public water now measure this November election. <laughs> Thank you very much. Tom Moore, president of the Marine Coast Water District. Thank you very much, Stuart. Push up. Thank you. All right. <laughs> we'll go to the last one. How's that? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so um, I am pitch hitting for Keith Vandermont, our Marine Coast Water District General Manager, who was unable to attend tonight, uh, using mostly his slides with a few tweaks of my own. So um, it would be helpful to get over to you. Um, so if I get any of this wrong, I'm sure there'll be someone in the audience to call me out. All right, so what I'd mostly like to focus on is this aerial electromagnetic survey and get you to understand what it is and why it in fact does refute a number of the claims that are made in the final EIR. Um, so we're going to take a look at current groundwater conditions as revealed by this aerial electromagnetic survey. Uh, we're going to take a look at some of the future impacts that uh, we can see from this survey if the Monterey Peninsula Water Supply Project desalination plant is built with six to nine slant wells going in on the CMEX property. And we'll talk a little bit more about water rights and harm to both Marina and the Ord community because Marine Coast Water District does serve all of the former Fort Ord. So what is this AEM thing? You probably all know uh, that magnetic fields penetrate through the entire Earth. That's how a compass works. So what we found is that there's a technology where you can hang a fairly large loop underneath a helicopter. <coughs> the loop would maybe fit side to side in this auditorium. And if you fly that helicopter 100 or so feet above the ground, as long as you're staying away from urban areas where there's lots of electrical wires above ground and below ground. So if you fly over farm fields where there's not much in the way of wiring, um, you can pulse magnetic field on that big antenna hanging beneath that helicopter 
And that magnetic field will penetrate the Earth down, uh, given the power of the magnetic field in this particular array, down as deep as a thousand feet below the surface of the Earth. A quick pulse, and what happens is that induces magnetic fields in the substances down to a thousand feet. And when you remove the magnetic field, the magnetic field that's been induced then collapses and produces a return signal. So this is a little like using magnetism for radar purposes to look about a thousand feet down in the ground. How deep you can look depends on the nature of the intervening materials. Uh, it works better in, for instance, um, water-saturated soils than it does, say, in clay, which has very little water in it. So we paid uh, a firm uh, to do this survey. They flew the number of miles that you see here uh, on the slide. Um, and I asked them roughly what this was equivalent to in terms of the kind of information that you would get from drilling a monitoring well down a thousand feet. They said, well, it's kind of like drilling a monitoring well about every 200 yards. So in 395 flight miles, that's equivalent to 3,400 monitoring wells in the ground. Now, uh, AEM doesn't give you exactly the same information that a monitoring well gives you. Um, so when Stanford produced all this electronic data, they then went and got data from 380 existing wells throughout this entire area shown on the screen. The, the little red squiggles are the track of the helicopter where there are breaks. That's because of roads that the helicopter couldn't fly over or power lines that the helicopter uh, that would interfere with the magnetic field. Um, so they ground truthed what they were getting from the AEM data against information that the County Water Resources Agency had on 318 existing wells. So uh, this is just a diagram which many of you may have seen before that gives you a rough idea of what the ground looks like in the vicinity of Marina and the CMEX property. Uh, the brown areas are what are called aquacludes, often clay, Water has a hard time moving horizontally or vertically through those brown areas. The light green and gray are uh, alluvial soils which contain water and through which water can move, albeit kind of slowly. Um, and what we see is that because of seawater intrusion and withdrawals on the right-hand side in the, the green color, past withdrawals, historic withdrawals by various wells, across the northern part of the Salinas Valley, that has tended to pull brackish water in from the sea. Well, at some point it's seawater, but as it moves inland, it begins to move the groundwater and therefore becomes uh, brackish. Um, the County Water Resources Agency has divided up this part of the uh, aquifer with these names. There is the perch dune sand, which is mostly above sea level. Uh, there's the so-called 180-foot aquifer, the 400-foot aquifer, and not shown here is the 900-foot aquifer. And these are mostly kind of like a layer cake where the chocolate is the water impervious layer, and the sponge cake is where the water sits in between. And so we've got, uh, let's see, uh, how many layers is this? That's uh, three layers of chocolate, so that must be a four-layer cake or something along those lines. All right, so... This, by the way, uh, the whole diagram is not necessarily the scale, but just wanted to give you a sense of where Calam put its test slant well. Um, the red is just solid pipe pulling water up from that test slant well. The dotted section is the screened portion of the well casing, and that's the portion of the well casing into which water will flow into that well to be pumped out. Now, here's one problem with this. First of all, uh, for erosion reasons, they originally planned to put that well and insert it closer to the coast than they were ultimately allowed. They had to pull it back from the coast so that it would survive longer due to coastal erosion. Um, and then when they built it, they could not get it with this experimental technology as far out under the ocean as they had hoped to get it. So they ended up 
with the screen on both sides of the dividing line between what's controlled by the State Lands Commission, which is water underneath the ocean, and the Salinas Valley Groundwater Basin, which legally defined as the Salinas Valley Groundwater Basin. So everything, every bit of water that they take to the right of that green line, they have been taking illegally. They have no rights to take that water. Um, whether or not they have rights to take water even to the left of that green line is something that could be argued at in court because even if you're only taking water from the left of that green line, if you're taking it in large enough amounts, you're also pulling in water from the right side of the green line, which you have no right to. All right, so let's talk about this, what, what the state and federal government say legally defines potable drinking water. So Title 22, Article 16, State Water Research Control Board says that any water that has less than 1,000 milligrams per liter in what are called total dissolved solids, meaning anything that water will uh, dissolve and go into solution in the water. If you've got less than 1,000 milligrams per liter, you have drinking water. If it's less than 3,000 milligrams per liter, you have a source of drinking water. Now, who lives in Marina? Okay, when you take a shower, do you ever have to wipe your shower down? You know, why, why do you do that? Don't you get a lot of Mineral. minerals on the glass if you don't wipe it down all the time? Well, that's because the water we're pumping from the ground is running oh, somewhere between 300 and 400 milligrams per liter of total dissolved solids. You drink it, you cook with it, it doesn't harm you at all. But anything below 1,000 is clearly drinking water. Here's what Cal Am says drinking water is, 500 milligrams per liter. And in anything, they would like you to believe that anything greater than 500 milligrams per water is no beneficial use. In fact, recently they gave a briefing to the Mayor's Committee, the Mayor's Water Authority, and on their first slide there was a bullet there that said, uh, this water that we propose to pull up through the slant wells, this water is of no beneficial use in its current form. Therefore, we propose to use it. <laughs> I thought that was a little bit of a strange statement, um, but let's parse that a bit. Um, they're implying that, well, you can't use this water without treatment. Well, I hate to tell you folks, the water that Marina Coast pumps and puts in your pipe comes from the ground. It has to be lifted out of the ground. We have to insert kinetic energy into it to get it out of the ground. That's a form of treatment. And oh, by the way, we don't just stuff it into the pipes. We have to chlorinate it to make sure we kill any viruses or bacteria that might be coming out of the ground. So even the water that we're pulling from all our wells must be treated. So you could say it's of no use in its current form. And so the statement is meaningless, right? But where did this 500 milligrams per liter come from? Some of you have probably seen these charts. And these charts were not made by Cal-Am. They have been used, I think, for somewhat misleading purposes by Cal-Am. These are charts that come from the County Water Resources Agency, which for quite a few decades has had concerns about seawater intrusion in the Salinas Valley Groundwater Basin. And we should all be concerned about that seawater intrusion in the basin because it supports not only urban areas like the city of Salinas, Marina, and the York community, but it supports a $4 billion a year agricultural industry in the Salinas Valley. So seawater intrusion is, in fact, a serious threat and needs to be taken seriously. But what do these charts show? They show a 500 milligram per liter uh, contour line over time. Now, why would the County Water Resources Agency produce a picture like this? Well, first of all, it gives you a hint over time of where there have been increasing levels of total dissolved, total dissolved solids in the Salinas Valley groundwater basin at two levels in that layer cake, the 180 and the 400-foot aquifer. Um, I think Cal-Am would like you to believe that everything behind to the west of that blue dotted line is useless water that nobody has any interest in. Marina Coast is still pumping 
from the 400-foot aquifer and putting that water uh, into those of you that we serve. So um, why would the county choose 500 milligrams and not the state-mandated 1,000 milligrams per liter in doing these contours? This is sheer speculation on my part. I've never asked the County Water Resources Agency, why'd you pick that number? But I will tell you that Casterville, what's Casterville's um, slogan for the city? Artichoke, capital of the world. And it turns out that artichokes as a plant are fairly tolerant to high levels of total dissolved solids. Um, so maybe 500 is a breaking line between, well, if you're over 500, you can't do strawberries, but you can do artichokes. Um, now that we have CSIP, you'll notice there are a lot more strawberries going in around Casterville. All right, so what did the AEM conclude? If you look at the blue, light, light purple, blue areas here in both the dune sand aquifer, the 180 and the 400, these are areas where Stanford has identified water that's at least 3,000 or less, meaning it's a source of usable drinking water for Marine Coast Water District. And you can see where CMEX is, and maybe you get a sense for why we're concerned about the possibility of six to eight slant wells going in right there on the coast and taking a lot of this usable water from us. All right, so county maps give you this also misleading impression of uniformity. Um, the county maps were developed from a more traditional hydrogeological modeling process where you have these sparse wells, single points of data, and what do you have to do if you're going to try and forecast what's happening between two wells when you have data from this well at point X and data from this other well at point Y and the data is a little bit different what do you assume? Well, you assume, almost forced to assume, that things change uniformly across the distance between those wells. What the AEM clearly shows is this is anything but a uniform Salinas Valley groundwater basin. Almost all conditions are local if you look at this. There are places where there are holes. There are places where there's vertical movement. Other places where there isn't vertical movement uh, of water basin. So that's a problem. Um, again, their data is based mostly on the sparse well, individual well data. But north of the Salinas River, there's been very little study by the County Water Resources Agency south of the Salinas River. Where's the CMEX plant? South of the Salinas River. Where's Marina? South of the Salinas River. That could be a problem. Right? Um, AEM was used to estimate how much usable water might be in the various parts of the dune sand aquifer, upper 180, lower 180, and 400 near Marina. Those are acre feet amounts. Marina Coast currently pumps uh, somewhere between about 3,500 and 4,000 acre feet per year to serve all of Marina and the Ord community. So this is a tremendous amount of water, uh, but if Cal Am is going to be taking uh, 10, 20, 30,000 acre feet per year from the CMEX property, you can see that that begins to potentially make a dent uh, into these. Some other problems. Uh, these are a couple of diagrams from the final EIR. You'll notice that the water level contour map here contains no contours south of the Salinas River. It goes to the lack of data. Um, there is CMEX and the marina area. Don't see any contours there south of the Salinas River. Uh, the diagram on the right uh, would have you believe that uh, the dune sand groundwater flows uphill away from the ocean. Whee! And, um, by the way, you have to note about this uh, vertically exaggerated, no scale. So I'm not sure what impression uh, is trying to be uh, conveyed. So uh, some of the modeling that cal -M did said uh, that they're going to influence what happens in the ground just within that big red circle. Well, 
guess what? We have a well right there. And when we ran our desalination plant, the brackish water desalination plant, we had a well right there next to the coast, uh, not about a thousand feet from the CMEX property. All right, so um, it's clear that all those wells on the CMEX property are going to start capturing quite a bit of usable groundwater uh, to which they have no rights and it's needed to serve Marina and the Ord community. Um, in the interest of time, let me move forward here to this. So what this is showing is that that uh, dune sand aquifer is flowing towards the ocean. And when it gets near the ocean, where there's no aquaclude between it and the 180 basin, it tends to drop down it's, and it is forming a seawater barrier. Our hydrogeologists say that CMEX slant well pumping will destroy that seawater barrier completely. Um, the red is the 400, and it's true that there's been quite a bit of seawater intrusion into the 400. So if built, um, we think that because of some assumptions they made, like the dune sand flows uphill away from uh, the ocean, that they've underestimated their capture zone, we're clearly convinced that they're going to capture more good water uh, than they think they will. Um, they'll eliminate a seawater barrier in the upper levels of the aquifer, and it's certainly going to make uh, the requirements of Marine Coast as a groundwater sustainability agency uh, difficult to restore conditions to 2015 conditions. Um, now, what's it going to cost you if you're a Calium customer? Well, these are based on figures provided in the EIR by uh, Calam. Um, if their assumption is correct that eventually pumping all those slant wells on CMEX will get to using only 7% of groundwater from the Salinas Valley groundwater basin, then you'll be facing a cost of around $7,600 per acre foot. The cost right now at Monterey One Water for Pure Water Monterey has promised they will produce water for and put it in the Seaside Basin is around uh, $2,2100 an acre foot, about less than one third of that cost. If Calam's assumptions are wrong and those slant wells start pulling in higher levels of return water, higher levels of good water, which then has to be returned to Castroville, which is five miles away on the other side of the Salinas River, <coughs> won't help Marina Coast any, your community any. Um, your, you, well, you can see uh, your cost for this desalination project could reach uh, as much as $13,000 per acre foot. And what happens once they build this plant <coughs> and discover that it's costing even $7,000 an acre foot to build, how much are they going to operate it? <coughs> you may end up having paid for a $300 or $400 million plant that only gets turned on in drought years. That sounds pretty expensive. All right, so um, I think I've sort of run out of my time, but here is the, the, the summary. Marina Coast will, in fact, be harmed. The, Final EIR doesn't even address water quality impacts of the proposed slant wells. It only talks about lowering of groundwater levels in uh, adjoining uh, wells. So no protections are offered by the CPUC or, or Calam, but I suppose that shouldn't be surprising because if you look at the law that established the California Public Utilities Commission, their number one goal in their series of important goals. And number one goal is to ensure that all private companies that are regulated utilities make a profit. That's their goal. They don't care about us. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, this is going to, if the CPCN is issued for Monterey Peninsula Water Supply Project, a whole bunch of costs are going to be shifted. Not only will you as Calium customers, experience some higher costs, but there'll be costs that Mayor Delgado is about to address 
uh, that will be shifted to the likes of Marina Coast, the City of Marina, and uh, the Ord community. We'll be burdened with more expensive supplies because our groundwater, which is our least expensive supply, is going to be affected. So what have we been doing? Um, we're certainly studying alternative projects. We are part of the Pure Water Monterey project. Uh, in fact, everyone who lives in the marina is currently uh, sending me emails complaining about the condition of uh, Crescent Avenue and various other streets in Marina, which have been dug up by our contractor building the conveyance pipeline. I'm happy to announce he promises he will repave those roads starting in early July, so it's coming. Um, and we have been participating in the CPN, CPCN process. We have, uh, we think, written very good documents refuting and pointing out a lot of the errors in the final EIR. Whether uh, the uh, California Public Utilities Commission listens to those, I don't know. And uh, I'm pretty sure that if a CPCN is issued for a large desal plant with slant wells for its source water on the CMEX Peninsula, uh, that somebody is going to file litigation, uh, which will likely, maybe for a number of years, delay the construction of that project. So, thank you very much. For your thank you. We're going to try to switch to this mic. Push the button. There you go. Is the light on? Should be a light on. There is a light on. Okay. There you go. Huge. Bruce Delgado, Mayor of uh, Marina. Thank you for that nice and extensive introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks everybody for being here tonight. Uh, I've been telling myself this is going to be a very friendly audience, and I've never been disappointed in this auditorium. So thanks for being here. My first point is that I don't dislike. Uh, Calium or its employees. I respect Calium's right to do business and its employees such as Ian Crooks and uh, Rich Finland, Catherine Stedman, and others I've met as doing their job to support Calium interests. As a resident of Marina, I volunteer my time to serve as mayor and to do what I can to protect and to serve the city of Marina, which I have come to love and cherish its people, its beautiful surroundings. Uh, the progress it's making for an improved quality of life and the stronger integrity that it has around its natural resources and environment on and off of former Fort Ord. The first point I want to make beyond that is that the Marina Coast Water District and the City of Marina want to partner with the Calab service area to solve the water issues uh, that we all have. The Pure Water Aid Pure Water Monterey Project is one example, bringing Calam jurisdictions 3,500 acre feet of water per year that we've heard about tonight as reclaimed water. It's a team effort, including the Marina Coast Water District, pipes moving the water through the city and the streets being uh, torn up for the installation of the pipeline, as Tom just mentioned, uh, so that the Calam service area can reduce its reliance on the Carmel River. A second example of collaboration is that in 2011, the Marine Coast Water District was the lead partner to own a public desal plant and publicly owned intake wells for the regional desalination project, which some of you may remember. Very similar to the 2018 uh, desal project that we're discussing tonight. A third example of our city's support is the lead role Marina took in addressing the erosion of Monterey Bay's beaches from the Salinas Valley south to Pacific Grove. This erosion was caused by the sand mining plant at the Semex site, and the successful effort to close the sand mine benefited all of our beaches, not just those in Marina. Marina wants to help the Calam jurisdictions, and we are, and we have been, however, as we have been, however, on the issue of the Calam desal plant in Marina, the proposed project, we have no choice but to protect our sacred water and our other community values and assets from the illegal water grab from Cal-Am. Our actions against the Cal-Am desal project will also help the peninsula from needlessly increasing your already highest water rates in the country. The Marina Coast Water District is helping with a much more affordable alternative for the peninsula, uh, a solution that I'll talk about a little bit later. 
The next point is about fairness. And at stake at first is the underground, the groundwater on which marina depends. Secondly, the above ground, habitat and environmental community values with which we identify as a city. And lastly, a coastal area that we want to improve and not to degrade. We just finished the bruising controversy toward the closure of the Samek sand plant. So this industrial area could be restored for passive recreation and environmental protection and education, not to serve it up for Calam to further degrade it with yet another industrial facility. You may remember in 2015, a dog club and dog park proposed in Carmel Valley also required an EIR, which, like the EIR under dispute we're talking about tonight, for desal facilities in and around Marina, found the dog park could go ahead. However, the Board of Supervisors rejected it due primarily to traffic and zoning issues of a dog park. Well, the desal plant we're talking about tonight is a multinational corporation forcing itself and this desal project on a small city and water district, potentially doing great harm to sacred groundwater and above ground assets. I respect the rights of the Carmel Valley residents to control your land and resource uses. Do you think Carmel Valley residents would have an opinion on this desal project were it to be proposed to be located in their neighborhood? <laughs> Windows on the Bay used to look more industrial than today. And the city of Monterey is in the midst of a multi-decade effort to beautify this area on Del Monte Boulevard. I respect and applaud the rights of Monterey to improve your coastline. Would Monterey residents want or allow Marina to install up to 10 slant wells on its beaches to fix Marina's water needs, but not provide any water to Monterey? San City, years ago, put in a 300 acre foot a year desal plant do any of you remember any serious discussion of locating Calam's 10,000 acre feet per year desalination plant within its own Calam service area? Instead, they went to Marina. My next point is that Marina bears the brunt of all the risks of this project and all of the adverse significant impacts, yet not a drop of water from the proposed project will come to Marina. So Calam is fighting for Marina to bear all the risk of groundwater contamination and to lose 4,000 to 12,000 homes worth of freshwater use. Calam expects Marina to shoulder all the above ground impacts to aesthetics on Marina's beaches and dunes, all the impacts to dune habitat, endangered plants and animals, great harm to Marina's passive recreation potential, and all the significant noise and air quality impacts as per the EIR, and to violate Marina's local coastal plan. Yet Marina, again, wouldn't get a drop of water from the desal project that Calam proposes. How does this stack up from the sense of fairness? Which side of this deal do you think is getting a raw deal? No one should be the loser from regional cooperation. Cooperation will be absolutely necessary for all of our futures whether it be public ownership of a regional desal plant that serves us all and all of us share in the costs of expensive water, whether it means preserving and protecting limited groundwater resources. All of this takes active collaboration and respect for each other's needs and resources. Calam stealing one jurisdiction water to solely benefit another without any legal rights to do so destroys the goals of regional cooperation for our future together. Ironically, all of this fighting, trying to keep Cal-Am from forcing itself on Marina, is completely unnecessary and invented by Cal-Am. In 2011, you may recall, a regional desal plant, eerily similar to the current one. It was approved, and it was more regional than the current proposal, because MCWD was to be the public owner of the public facilities, including the desal plant itself, and a combination of vertical and slant wells and depending on what was the most environmentally friendly and least expensive combination. A conflict of interest, sorry, a conflict of interest on the part of a consultant, Steve Collins, which really hurt no party or the project and could have easily been cured or corrected. This provided a door through which Calam rushed.
claiming the 2011 project was null and void. Really? So that entire project and its approved EIR were scrapped. So another project could start all over. The new project was exactly like the old project, except in two important ways. First, the new project kicked one member, Marina Coast Water District, off the previous team. Second, no combination of slant and vertical wells was any longer possible because Cal-Am can't legally drill vertical wells under Marina like Marina Coast Water District could. So now the desal plant and the intake wells would be privately owned and profited by Cal-Am and would be necessarily more expensive because Cal-Am was guaranteed an 8% profit on capital investment. Fast forwarding four years, a subsequent conflict of interest was exposed in 2015 involving Dennis Williams, who was not only doing the modeling work for Cal-Am's application for the test net well, but he was also serving as a consultant to the project's regulator, the CPUC, as a member on the project's hydrologic working group of experts. But there's more. While simultaneously representing the project applicant and the project's regulator, which is a serious double agent situation of its own, Williams also holds three patents for slant well technology Cal-Am is using, which means he stands to profit if the test well succeeds after he advises the CPUC that the project that depends on his technology should be safe for Marina's groundwater. Surprising to me, given how a much less problematic conflict was used to torpedo the last desal project in 2011 and boot the public ownership component from the project, this Dennis Williams Cal-Am conflict of interest wasn't a game changer, like the one that torpedoed the 2011 project. The Dennis Williams Cal-Am conflict of interest was only a wrinkle that caused some delay to look over Dennis's previous work then everything continued as if nothing had happened. Does anyone sense a significant double standard here? As if maybe cal -Am wanted to so badly cut out the transparency and lower costs that the public agency, MTWD, would bring the project, but also to take ownership of the $400 million project and make large profits as the private owner of the desal for its shareholders. So the 2011 conflict of interest was blown out of proportion, apparently couldn't be cured, and voided the entire regional desal project. Yet the substantive 2015 Dennis Williams conflict resulted in no change to the project team, and Williams himself is still advising the CPUC as an expert on the hydrologic working group while holding the patents from which he could financially gain in a great way should they be implemented for this project. Those of you who are ratepayers within the Cal-Am service area have paid for this experimental desalinization project, yet you will not own it nor benefit from any patents. My next point regards environmental justice. Arguably, Marina is less affluent than the cities and the unincorporated areas within the Cal-Am service area. We are a humble, working class, ethnically diverse town whose environs have already been chosen as a location for the region's sewage treatment plant, the region's landfill facilities, and our region's only sand mining operation since the other three sand mines in the Monterey Peninsula area were long ago closed due to their environmental impacts. Already, residents in Marina closest to these industrial facilities frequently complain of odors so strong that even when the doors and windows of their homes are closed, they can't escape foul-smelling odors. Now, the industrial Cal-Am desal intake wells are being forced upon us in Marina. Instead of being located where the water would be used, such as at Sand City, cumulatively, the addition of the desal project to the existing regional industrial facilities in and around Marina would further reduce the quality of life and community values in Marina. Well, we all know that for decades around the world, lower income, minority dominated neighborhoods and cities have been saddled with industrial facilities that serve more affluent communities which don't want industry in their backyard. The insult to injury 
that Cal-Am's industrial facilities would add to Marina is a poster child for environmental injustice. My next point is that there is no mitigation, as Tom referred, if Cal-Am science is wrong. There is no installation proposed of any engineering components, such as an underground seawater intrusion barrier, seawater intrusion barrier to protect Marina's groundwater from Cal-Am's project before its construction, or to even do so if Cal-Am science is wrong and its project advances seawater intrusion under Marina after construction. There's no cure or repair proposed in the EIR to, to the, if, if the groundwater under Marina is contaminated by the project, were Cal-Am science to be wrong, and Marina's concerns come to pass as a result of this project. The EIR does not propose any mitigation to fix our contaminated groundwater, if that's the result. But the idea has been floated that maybe water could be trucked into Marina should our groundwater become undrinkable. <laughs> the price could be tens of millions of dollars to clean Marina groundwater should it be contaminated as a result of the cal amp well wells. And who would pay for this mitigation and reparation of a damaged water basin? I would guess it would be Cal-Am ratepayers and not Cal-Am. My second to last point is that there's no need for a desal project at this time because there's alternative, non-controversial water available. If it wasn't for Cal-Am's profit motive, Cal-Am would welcome the alternatives for additional water that would preclude the need for an expensive and damaging desal plant. Monterey One Water, formerly the Pollution Control Agency, has demonstrated that the pure Monterey water reclamation project could be expanded at a very reasonable price compared to desal water to provide an additional 2,250 acre feet of water per year. Cal-Am has opposed progress on this idea. I think it obvious Cal-Am wants a project it can own from which it can profit at the expense of its ratepayers and marina. An expanded pure water Monterey project and if Cal-Am were to accept Marina Coast Water District's offer to loan Cal-Am 600 acre feet of water for up to 30 years, would get Cal-Am into compliance with the Carmel water extraction and from out from underneath the cease and desist disorder of the State Water Board. This would give us enough time to regroup around a truly regional and much more affordable desal project that had the legal rights to any groundwater needed. My final point is that water is sacred to us all, like air and food. I want to conclude with something on which we can all agree. Like water, I'm sorry, like air and food, water is a sacred asset and critical for our communities as a whole well-being. Marina is in the unenviable but understandable position of working hard to protect its water and several other community and environmental values and assets. I hope you tell your friends about what you heard tonight, and I hope you have the success in November election to do a much needed feasibility study on a buyout of Cal-Am. Information is power, and the more information on the table usually leads to better decisions. So I thank you for your time to come here tonight to learn more about the proposed desal project in Marina. Please. So let's go back to the 
nice young lady that was going in after the press time. Can you step up to the mic? I suppose it's on. Who's the mic? For quite a while, we noticed that the mayors represent people within uh, CalM users in the cities. Uh, but I wonder why we do not have any Monterey County supervisors that represent the interests of the people who live, the residential people who live in the county areas. Thank you. Yeah, where are they at? Uh, Mary, you're still here? Do you want to answer that? <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> So, Mary, uh, do you know why the county's not been participating in the mayor's authority group? So that the unincorporated has that representation? Um, actually, the reason that I cannot participate um, was the reason that the county council gave me, which is because of some uh, legal configuration. If I were to attend and be part of the mayor's authority because of the way it is uh, organized, I would lose my seat on the Monterey County Board of Supervisors. The mayor's authority would trump, essentially, my uh, service on the Monterey County Board of Supervisors. And given that uh, choice, I felt that I would serve my community better by remaining on the Monterey County Board of Supervisors. So since the mayor's authority was created by those who created it, I suppose if they wanted county representation, they could have had Lou Bellman, uh, the chief administrator of the county, or somebody else representing the county's interest, but they chose to have city elected officials only. But I think that would have been their choice. They're the ones who drafted that joint powers authority, all of its bylaws, et cetera. Uh, yes, I have uh, multiple questions. The first question is, <clears throat> the existing C-Mix property has rights to only 500 acre feet of potable water. Who is responsible for enforcing the Monterey County Ordinance? Second question is... Excuse me, Ken, let's take these one at a time so that we don't forget them. Okay. Uh, Tom, do you want to answer that question? So there is an agreement that is quite old, it's from the early 90s, between uh, prior owners of the CMEX property, I also involved the Marine Coast Water District and the County Water Resources Agency. The agreement says that once they decide to do some non sand mining development on the CMEX property, they could be provided up to 500 acre feet per year of groundwater by Marina Coast Water District. Uh, but first, they would have to have themselves connect into what's called Zones 2 and 2A, and the agreement called for them, I don't remember the exact amount, but it was a million dollars or a couple of million dollars they would have to pay to get the next in, and then they would also be burdened with the property tax increment uh, going forward. They've not done that. Uh, now, they're not going to be building housing on the CMEX plant. We don't expect that they are, in fact, going to cough that up. Um, so, kind of throws that 500 acre foot issue into the vote. What was your next question, Ken? Uh, I'd like to add a comment to that. My understanding is both the Army and Marina Coast paid close to $20 million and also at the time it was Lone Star, not CMEX, and they paid into it and they've been paying into it. And that's why that, my understanding is that's why they were limited to 500 acre feet. So maybe at the next time, next meeting when you you have the answers for this lady here. You can also find that information. Second question is, my opinion is, Marina Coast received $550 million grant from Congress to build a regional desalinization plant. And of that $550 million, $50 million was to take down San Clemente Dam. And, and because of that, the Colin, my opinion is the Collins issue was fabricated because there was no profit for Cal Land. And what I want to do is tie these 
comments into the main issue. Um, and also, Marina Cruz has fought Monterey County on the redacted testimony of county, county council, two supervisors, and other county officials. And Marina Cruz took up the task to the Supreme Court and prevailed. And so now they're going to have to unreject those comments. And I think that's when all this friction is going to disappear. And my last comment is <clears throat> um, on the comment of Water One. My understanding is Water One doesn't have an approved project with the regulatory approvals. This is, I, I think, Water One is all fabrications, and that's why I don't think the cost per acre foot is what Water One is saying is possible. So the whole thing, what I'm trying to say is because of the conflict with the Calam and the county, the conspiracy has been there not to benefit the ratepayers. Thank you. Thank you, Ken, for all your leadership on the Coast Water District for many years. Yes. Hi, thanks for coming tonight. Uh, just a, a quick brief thing, I'll put this back there for the next speaker. Um, in science, you need a baseline. And several years ago, the team from um, Stanford came over here and they did a survey. But in that survey, there was one spot along Monterey Bay that they were refused access to. And that was the CMEX plant because Calam was there. Calam would not let them come in. So they cannot have a good baseline. But they do now with that new system. And maybe in a couple of years they can do it again. But unfortunately, we have lost the original baseline from a few years ago because they would not let them come in. Thank you, Dan. Anyone else with a question? Yeah. I see Thank you. Yes. Oh, no, you go ahead. Okay, okay. Yeah. So we were encouraged to go to the Coastal Commission meeting, and I know that when the Coastal Commission was at CSUMB, uh, last year, there were some people that came and spoke about the CNX and other issues. So I would like to know and get a better understanding of the relationship among the different jurisdictions, uh, entities that have the decision-making power, the State Water Resources Board, the PUC, and also the Coastal Commission. What would the Coastal Commission be uh, deciding? Why would be people be addressing the Coastal Commission? What jurisdiction would they um, affect? And then the other quick question is, thank you all for both the comment. Thank you for all you said and shared with us. And Kathy Biala, she mentioned 23, and I didn't know if she was referring to 23 groups that were joining this thing, or were there 23 agreements that were made? When you, remember when you said 23? I didn't get the reference to what the 23 referred to. So there's approximately 21 to 23 parties who are okay. confidentially okay. working through settlement discussions. Uh, so that's what she was referring to. And Kathy will speak to the Coastal Commission question. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. State Lands Commission, too, that question. Okay. State Lands Commission after Coastal Commission. I'll address the uh, California Coastal Commission. They have been involved in the past, and we don't know exactly what their role might be in the future. Uh, they are very much promoting um, the slant well technology. But they have been involved in this particular project on three um, critical issues. The first one being that over the heads of the, um, uh, the city council vote 
um, against the uh, test slant well. They went to the Coastal Commission who approved it. And the second one was, uh, I think uh, Tom mentioned how um, the, uh, the slant well was allowed to be moved further inland rather than way out in the ocean. The California Coastal Commission approved that. It was just a cross outline of changing the, uh, the feet uh, of the length of the pipe and where it was. And the third one just happened in December of this past year. Um, the slant well was to be dismantled after uh, its operation. And the Coastal Commission uh, administratively approved extension of that for a year um, without dismantling and, uh, and putting it the operation down to a maintenance mode. And this is, by the way, I will tell you that this slant well has a defect in it. 25% of the pipe um, has a casing around it that could not be moved. And yet that was approved and allowed to, to continue. And um, the Coastal Commission then approved that this slant well, which will become an operational well if the project is approved totally, um, that will be one of the operating wells. And it has 25% of the casing still remaining in it. Bruce? Well, Bruce? One, one second, Tom. Tom, do you know about the State Lands Commission role? So the State Lands Commission is an entity that would have to uh, give a anyone who wants to take minerals, and water we now know is considered to be a mineral, uh, from beneath the ocean floor because everything from something like the mean high tide line out to the ocean and beyond, uh, it is the State Lands Commission that is permitting the authority for the taking of that resource from the ground. Um, the Coastal Commission and the State Water Resources Control Board have interests, uh, have decided that open ocean intakes are a bad thing. We don't ever want an open ocean intake. We only want underground intakes. So that's one reason why they are pushing so hard or being, if you will, not too cooperative with some of the issues that we have raised and the city has raised with them. Um, and of course the CPUC, they just want to make sure that their regulated utilities make a profit and you know after that they want to make sure that I guess um, their customers of those regulated utilities don't get too badly gouged. Thank you Tom. Thank you Judy. Other questions? Yeah, back. I would like to ask maybe Ms. Fiala about the snowy plover. Uh, that's a big subject. <laughs> <laughs> what, what would you like to hear most? Well, I understand that the birth rate has declined a bit. Okay, so you understand that the birth rate has declined a bit. Yes. Okay, well, Kathy will take it from there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, on the three sites that have been identified um, as marina sites, um, I have been tracking since the slant well uh, went into uh, operation and when it was built, and that, that was 2005, January. And since that time, our uh, populations of nests and nest hatch data for our beautiful threatened species, the western snowy plover, have plummeted. And uh, we have attempted to um, discuss this with um, federal and state agencies and uh, their take at this point is that uh, un until it drops below a certain uh, target area uh, that, that was designated in 2010, that they're really not that interested. When I think that it's very coincidental that our western snowy plovers were actually increasing um, and then beginning 2015 when the slant well it came into existence and was built and operated, uh, we see some extremely uh, concerning numbers now. And to add to that, uh, we didn't have time in our presentations to go into some details we would have liked to. And one of our community values and one of our assets in Marina is we have some of the best nesting habitat on our beaches for the western snowy plover, <coughs> which is an endangered species. And the EIR uh, discloses the fact that four acres of nesting habitat will be permanently lost in marina 
but it's okay because overall in the region, the snowy plover should be doing, should be hitting the targets that the Fish and Wildlife Service has set for it. So again, it's an example of Marina takes the brunt, gets no water from the project, and it's just a pattern that I tried to out, tried to uh, demonstrate in, in my comments. I have a question, Kathy. Yes, and I just want to add one thing, uh, it's like injury to insult. Um, it's all the other things about the water and now our western snowy plovers. And, you know, we have the Eco uh, Hotel on Sand City property that's coming in and um, people are not looking at the total impacts along our, our bay and we're very privileged to have this threatened species. They're, they're incredibly cute um, and um, they're, they're going to be gone. How is it, I have a question, how is it that this um, I guess it goes back to, if you're not at the table, you're not on the menu. I mean, you're, you're on the menu. But um, how did it happen that Caliban could design this whole thing to take Marina's groundwater and give it to Castroville? Would you say more about this return water agreement? I, you just kind of went over it briefly, but I'm, I think it's part of the biggest issue here, which people need to understand. Caliban's estimates are that they're going to take approximately 1,000 acre feet of fresh water as part of their take. And that they will have to give that water back to the Salinas Valley Basin, and they will do so by shipping it north of Salinas River for Castroville's use, Castro, Community Service District of Castroville's use. The problem with that is that, as you saw in one of the graphs, and Tom had to go quicker than he probably would have liked, that was part of that fresh water that was pushing down and out the salt water at the 400 foot aquifer. So if you take that fresh water out and send it north, there's less pressure on the salt water that's intruding the 400 foot aquifer, and the 400 foot aquifer is going to flow more inward, inland, than it was prior. Marina Coast Water District's estimates are that the fresh water may be as much as 3,000 acre feet of water, not the 1,000 that Cal Am predicts. Well, every acre foot of water is enough for four homes. So, a thousand acre foot of water, Calam estimate, is 4,000 homes worth of fresh water. Marina Coast Water District's 3,000 acre foot estimate is 12,000 homes worth of fresh water. So, we'll be taking out between 4,000 to 12,000 homes worth of fresh water use from the 180 and the dune aquifer, re reducing the pressure on the underlying aquifer, which is the 400, where we get half of our water now, and so that is an issue. How they chose to go to Castroville, instead of putting it back where the harm was done when they took it, uh, I don't know the answer to that question. Tom, did you? Sure, I'd be happy to. And again, you're asking a question about thinking of folks in the minds of Calam can't do a Vulcan mind mill with you happy. Um, would be nice, I suppose, if I could, could accomplish that. But I think it perhaps maybe speculation on my part, um, related to the fact that with the demise of the regional project, Calium sued Marine Coast. And so you're in this contentious litigation situation maybe you're not all that interested in, in cooperating. Here is an example of cal -Am's perspective. In the public evidentiary hearings in San Francisco, on the, we all had to give testimony. All those 23 parties that wanted to participate had to give written testimony and then give oral testimony. <coughs> they each other and respond to each other's rebuttals. When cal -Am was asked why they don't take the water that Marina Coast wants to give them? Their answer was, because we don't want them to use the money that we pay them for the water that's not desal to be used against us by them filing lawsuits. <laughs> so their first line of thought was not what's right for the people, what's the, least, what's the most affordable, what's the least environmental damage. It's what might Marina Coast Water District do with that money? We've had a litigative, uh, litigious uh, combat in the past. We sure don't want to give any dollars to an agency that might sue us in the future. 
So we do not want any solution water, any alternative to desal water from Marina Coast Water District that they would have to pay for. But it wasn't the kind of reasoning that any of you would want to be used, and it wouldn't be used by a public agency because that have to be out in the open. Uh, so I think that's part of the reason that Tom answered your question the way he did. Thank you. But we, I don't know myself. So Bruce, we have a question up here. I, wanna, I just, just want to add one kind of comment on the return water agreement. It's a premium that we have to pay on the peninsula. If this, is, if this process goes, the project gets approved, it's a premium we have to pay on the peninsula for water that actually is available only in that area. But we have to pay to get it and process it. So it's another 5 to 10% premium on top of the bills that we would already pay in order to have the privilege of getting the rest of the water, the 90% part. So there's, there's just all sorts of incremental costs in this process that keep rolling up on the peninsula side on a project that is more of a threat in more ways than anybody's appreciated. I mean, you're getting, a, you're getting appreciation of it tonight. Bruce? Um, I've only been in Monterey for a couple of years. And uh, so I guess I'm coming in just a little on the fresh side. I'm kind of watching what's going on, sort of an arm's length. I'm concerned about my water bill, of course, but other than that, it's been at that arm's length. Uh, sitting here tonight, it looks like Cal Am's an 800 pound gorilla, and everybody's afraid to touch him. Uh, what's the story on that? <laughs> well, they're, they're a big organization uh, nationwide and beyond, and they're doing what's in their best business interest. And the rest of us are doing what we can to challenge them on something that we don't agree with and that we're very concerned about. Kathy, no, not Ken. Can her uh, presentation. Get some other questions before we go back to Ken, please. Okay. This gentleman standing by the mic. Okay. Uh, Kathy mentioned in her presentation that uh, no body, no regulatory body, has been willing to uh, make a water rights determination. And I think she made a very good point that that would seem like an early issue to be addressed for any water project by anybody, anyway. Um, if my understanding is correct, it's the State Water Resources Control Board that would make that determination, or correct me if I'm wrong. But in any event, a body that has the authority to do that, why have they not done that? What is preventing them or making them not want to do that? Well, I think they could give their opinion and also the courts could give their opinion. George, do you want to take that question? About why, haven't, why hasn't the State Water Board yet given their opinion? Um, well, the State Water Board um, said there's a process that Cal-Am can go through that might result in having water rights. And Kathy went through this a little bit where um, uh, Cal-Am has to get the water, get the wells, pump the water, take it for five years, and then evaluate whether there's been any harm or not, and then they have the right to appropriate rights to water. So it's all after the fact. So Kellyanne does not have an argument that they have water rights, but they have the argument that they can get water rights if they can get the project approved. Yeah. It's a little bit cart before the horse issue, yeah. Yeah. major yeah. issue. And I want to go back to just one comment about the 800-pound grill. Um, Public Water Now has sponsored this petition and this initiative to be on the November ballot. That is taking on the 800-pound grill. Yes. And what we're seeing is that, and this, uh, this, this program tonight gives you a taste of this, the impact of Calam's project goes far beyond just the peninsula. It shows a selfishness on part of the company to just get water for the peninsula, period, to hell with everybody else who's outside of the peninsula. So Marina gets screwed, Marina Coast gets screwed, the, the, the public gets screwed, the residents there get screwed, because there's no, there's no payoff of any kind in the marina area. None. And Calam had a partner pro partnership project going before when it was mentioned earlier, the, the regional desal project. It was public engagement, public agencies involved. It was a shared process. It only cost about $3,000 an acre foot. Once that died, Cal-Am came back. The lowest estimated cost 
is about $4,000 per acre, so acre foot on this price. That's the lowest. It goes up as high as $7,000 per acre foot. Just nobody knows exactly what goes into that, um, that cost. But what we do know is that we do know there are some costs that we can identify. The site wells, for example, was first proposed to be a $4 million experimental test well. It's over $20 million now, from $4 million to $20 million, and it keeps going. We're the only ones, I mean, I'm, just, I'm not saying, this community is trying to stand up for its interests in a way that's responsible, which is, let's get the facts on what Calam costs the community in general. What could a public agency do in an equivalent way? Same water, same employees, same result. You get water, you turn on the tap, you get water. But how much cheaper would it be if it were a public agency? How much more responsible would the agency be managing the watershed, the water supply, the environmental issues around it? Calam doesn't do any of that now. They just get the water, sell it to you, and, and, and send 50 cents of every dollar that we pay, you pay. 50 cents of every dollar is shipped, is, is shipped out of our community. That's what a corporation does. It's a monopoly elephant, it's an 800 pound gorilla, absolutely. And we think if, 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 if we pay attention and we follow through and we know the facts, Cal will not argue with us on the facts. We're trying to put out as much fact as we can on all the flyers we have. Mm -hmm. Marina Costa does the same thing. There's some great flyers out on the table. Take them, take them, understand this issue. But the real solution, there's a real change that's really possible and it's really close. And it's going to depend on people like you and many other people who we don't even know. But they have to show up and vote on November. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We're done unless there has to be. I'm sorry, there's somebody in the mic, so we'll do that. The last question. Just a footnote to what you finished saying. I, <clears throat> sorry. I saw in some of the literature that public water now has circulated that we have the most expensive, or we recently had the most expensive water in the country. On the same informational packet, it said that among the 10 most expensive water sources in the country, there's a place called Norristown, Pennsylvania. Norristown is a community just outside of Philadelphia. It happens that I grew up there. Now, it's not surprising that water is expensive in California. California was semi-arid. But Norristown is in semi-arid. Norristown gets 40 inches of rain a year. Water has never been scarce in Norristown. It has a river running right through the town, the Schuylkill River, which was decontaminated about 50 years ago, has been the source of water ever since. I don't understand how Cal Am can be charging that much money for water in southeastern Pennsylvania. So to let everyone go home very soon, mm -hmm. let's turn it over to George to respond. Thank you. Wow. First of all, it's a national survey done by some other organizations. We didn't pick those. They did. They picked large, um, large uh, water companies, um, and it was their survey. We didn't pick however it came out. We did do some research on there are two public agencies in the top ten. One of them has a major infrastructure project underway being paid for in their bill. The other has a uh, drought-related problem related to it, which I can't remember. I mean, a, a water a quality issue related to it. I don't remember the details, but this is what you should understand about the highest water bill we have in the country right now. It does not include a new water supply for desal. It does not include the Pure Water Monterey project for 3,500 acre foot. It does not include the slant wells. Those, uh, well, it doesn't include the pipeline either. All those things are going to be on top of the highest water bill in the country. <laughs> Just so you know what you're facing. Okay. And Tom has told me that there's an anonymous question about whether Marina would support an open intake, open ocean intake desal plant. When we say goodnight, if that anonymous person could tap me on the shoulder, I'll be happy to answer that just so that everyone doesn't have to stay. Uh, but basically the answer is yes, depending on the devil and the details. And Ken, I know you have more questions, but I think you had a fair share earlier tonight. And so I think you should tap Tom or me or Kathy on the shoulder once everyone starts to leave if you want to talk to us more, okay? So that everyone doesn't have to stay longer and they can get back to their personal life. Thanks, everybody.